Tell me to say what's up. Okay, that's okay. Here we go. Here we go. So in the talk, when I get to see it occasionally, what I want to do is just to, for those of you who've forgotten what a lithium ion battery is, remind you about that, talk a little bit about how they work and how they fail, where some of the challenges are, where some of the new directions are, and how some materials function, and then talk about some new magnetic resonance and optical methods to study batteries, and then talk about the fast charging story. So apologies for this very basic slide, but just to remind you of why we're interested in lithium ion batteries. You know, if you look at the difference between the half cell couple for lithium versus lead, so lead acid batteries were the sort of premier rechargeable batteries 20 years ago, you know, you're gaining almost three volts from moving from lead to lithium. And of course, lithium is much lighter. And so this was all put together now into 1990 uh, the, with the Sony rocking chair battery, where Sony took lithium cobalt oxide developed by John Goodenough in Oxford and the graphite, um, initially they took a hard carbon, so a more disordered uh, graph graphitic material and they put it together in a so-called rocking chair battery. And it was called a rocking chair battery because the lithium ions went backwards and forwards as you charged and discharged. And this slide makes a number of points. It's not just about having an active material. You need to put the active material together with a binder to hold the whole thing together as the materials expand and contract. You need to have an active material uh, with the active material, sorry, a, a conducting material, typically a carbon black, and that allows you to get the electrons in more readily. And then you need to hold it together, as, as I said, with the binder, but the binder then has to, has to be porosity in all of this. So the lithium ions can get in through the electrolyte. The electrolyte will has to be non-aqueous because you've got almost a four volt different between, difference between the lithium cobalt oxide and the graphite. And um, obviously an aqueous system has no more than a, about 1.4 volts stability window. Um, and so then on the anode side, it's a graphitic material that nominally safely intercalates or holds the lithium ions. And all the carbon work was done by people like John Mark Murphy and Bell Labs and Bruno Scrisati and others, which was all put together to form this material. So then the next sort of points I want to make is that it's, you can vary the, both the, um, the redox couple, but also the structure to try and get different um, voltages of your system. So uh, lithium in carbon has a potential versus lithium metal that's um, almost the same. So the, the fully lithiated LIC6 um, has a half cell couple of about 70 millivolts. So it's almost as reduced as lithium as itself. And then lithium cobalt oxide, you can see is sitting between about 3.6 and 4.3 volts if you pull out about 50% of the lithium. But if you go for a phosphate like this lithium cobalt phosphate, you can push up the voltage even further. And the first materials that were developed by Stan Whittingham before John Goodenough and that John, Stan Whittingham was one of the other uh, people who received the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago with John and um, um, and his his invention was the lithium titanium sulfide, which was also a rechargeable material. But you can see the voltage is much lower, and that's because um, the sulfur is more covalently bonded to the titanium, and that then lowers the redox couple of the titanium. It's also because titanium is to the left of the periodic table, and so the redox couple is lower than that. And so when you're trying to design a lithium ion battery, you want to think about, first of all, what transition metal you're using, but also what structural type you're considering. And the difference in this cobalt um, oxide from the phosphate is that because the phosphates are much more covalent, that oxygen is more strongly bound to the phosphorus. And so the lithium in there is quite ionic. And so you end up pulling the voltage of that system up. You can also look at um, the, the energy densities. And so in order to work out how much of material you can get out of it, we use this unit milliampers per gram. And so if you're a lithium cobalt oxide, that's almost as efficient as you can get on the metal side. And if you pull out all of the lithium, you get about 274 milliampers per gram. If you look at pull out all of the lithium on lithium cobalt phosphate, because you're taking the extra weight of the phosphate, the, the capacity drops down to about 170 milliampers per gram. And if you're a sulfide, the capacity will drop down even more because of the sulfur versus the oxygen. 
Now in practice, you can't extract more than about 50% of the lithium from the lithium cobalt oxide because you get a whole series of degradation reactions that I'll touch on as we go through the talk. But the, from the perspective of doing research in a university setting, I think one thing that's really important to note is that we've gone from the lithium titanium sulfide battery, I just touched on a second ago, through to the lithium um, cobalt oxide systems, through to the um, nickel manganese cobalt oxide material I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. And we've increased the energy density by about a three, about a factor of three. At the same time, engineering and improvements in systems and also the mass production from these gigafactories has reduced the cost of the lithium ion battery now, um, now down by about a factor of 10 or even a factor of 30. Um, so in the, the price of a lithium ion battery is typically quoted in these units of, um, you know, 100 kilowatt hours. Um, and so um, it's dropped down almost as, as low as 100. Uh, and so if we're really going to make an impact, we have to do something radically different. We can't just keep on studying the NMCs. And this is what motivates work into technologies such as lithium air, lithium sulfur, and magnesium. So at the same time, we have to make it sustainable. And so I'm going to stand up here. Hopefully you can pick me up and zoom if I say this, because I can't read the slides otherwise. If you look at the cobalt production, so at the moment with 45 gigafactories are being built, we're going to need 180, 840,000 tons a year of lithium, 193,000 um, 193, tons a year of cobalt, and that's more than the production in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so there, this is a country where mining is associated with child labor issues and other um, whole societal issues. It's also a very unstable country. And yet these are the requirements for the current generation of NMC materials. If you look at lithium, lithium in principle is one of these elements where there's enough of it around, but with the, the projected use of it, it starts to be critical. This is a picture I took a few years ago when I was in Chile in the Atacama deserts. And so lithium is found in, in minerals, which are either in, in, the, in the mountains themselves, in places like uh, Australia, you can mine it directly in minerals such as spodumene, but in many parts of the world, uh, particularly the regions of Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, uh, the rain falls on the Andes and the lithium and the other minerals leach out into these high desert salars or salt lakes, which are very rich in magnesium, potassium and lithium. And then these mining companies come in and they pump out the lithium from these brines. The lithium evaporates, uh, but at the same time, you're extracting all of the water from these resources, from these lakes and the lakes are dropping. And that has impact both on the, the locals who live nearby, but also with the, the various birds and, and algae that supply, rely on, on these lakes. And so in order to address this, we're going to have to think about trying to uh, recycle the stuff that we're getting out of the ground. And the question is, how do we do that in an efficient and sustainable way? So I talked about the lack of cobalt and the fact we can't um, just use lithium cobalt oxide. And so this has then motivated this whole massive research area where people went from the lithium cobalt oxide with its energy density of about 120 to 124 milliampers per gram. And they went all the way to lithium nickel oxide. And then they realized that that material is really not very stable. It, it loses oxygen if you go to too high voltages. And so people then did a whole series of doping experiments where they replaced back the nickel for cobalt and aluminium to form these NCA materials. So the NCA materials are in the current generation of electric vehicles with this other material, NMC811, where you've got 80% nickel, 10% magnesium, 10% cobalt, being the sort of next generation of materials. But the problem with this material is it degrades more readily. And so at the moment, it's a compromise between trying to minimize cobalt, maximize nickel, and maximize, minimize the degradation. And you know, the sort of sad stories at the moment is that the, the whole energy market and minerals market has now shifted away from cobalt as being an issue. Now nickel is the problem and nickel is also used in the construction industry 
Uh, and so the whole nickel price um, is, is dependent very much on, on construction as well. So if you think about where do we go next, uh, one of the obvious uh, things to replace uh, lithium with is sodium. And sodium, of course, is extremely reactive as well. So you're going to build a, a battery with uh, similar energy density. It turns out lithium, um, the, the couple of lithium is a little bit lower than that of sodium. So you're going to lose something based on that. You're also going to lose because sodium is obviously um, bigger and it's also um, heavier. So the energy density is going to come down because of that. But you can gain from a very simple thing. So you've got to use a current collector to get the electrons in and out. Typically on the anode, you use copper. You do that because um, if you were to use aluminium, which is the other light uh, metal that would be used, uh, lithium reacts with the aluminium, but um, sodium doesn't. So you can build um, a, a sodium ion battery with aluminium current collectors on both sides. And in, in um, principle, at least, you can take a cathode material and you can actually design sodium uh, materials where you get rid of the cobalt. And you do it for sort of quite an interesting reason. Uh, what you try to do in these layered materials is try to find transition metal ions that like being in layers and don't like moving into these lithium layers or sodium layers. But because sodium is so much bigger, it props the layers up more and the ions tend to move less. And so you don't need to use cobalt. You can actually move to elements such as iron, um, Fe, or uh, nickel and titanium. And so that's another um, reason for using a sodium ion battery. And um, it's almost a drop in technology, meaning you can use all of the same manufacturing lines to make a sodium ion battery as you could a lithium ion battery. Uh, one of the disadvantages though, is you can't use graphite. So you can put potassium into graphite, so you can make a potassium battery with graphite, you can do lithium, but sodium is just the wrong size. It's the sort of relative size of the sodium versus the benzene rings that make up the graphene sheets of graphite. And so you've got to use these more disordered carbons, which come with different problems of the, this lower capacity, and there's also more degradation on the surface of these things. And so that's a big um, area of research, is trying to optimize the anode for this material. Now, I'm not going to talk about today, but something that's going on in this department is a collaboration between my group and Dominic Wright's group to try and come up with new salts for sodium ion batteries. So instead of just using the standard salt in a lithium ion battery, which is LiPF6, you can, um, you can use, so you can make NaPF6, but you can also think about other salts that might have more beneficial, um, beneficial um, properties in a sodium ion battery. Okay, so what about the rest of the periodic table? There's a lot of discussion about aluminium batteries, and one that comes to mind is magnesium. So the reason for magnesium is that you can in principle think about materials uh, where if you pull a magnesium out, you obviously pull out two, a two plus ion versus a one plus ion, so you need to compensate that with a two plus change in the redox or, um, of the of the various transition metal ions. And so you can find cathode materials in principle that have fewer spaces to intercalate the magnesium ions. And so in principle, you could get higher energy densities. The challenge, of course, is fairly obvious to most of the chemists here, is that because it's a two plus ion, it moves more slowly in, a, in, in the lattice. So the activation barriers are much higher. There's also a less obvious reason, and maybe that in retrospect is, is fairly obvious, is that if you put a magnesium ion in solution, it's much more strongly solvated. So it's quite difficult to get it from the electrolyte into the um, cathode or the anode material. And so the best material um, to date is a sulfide material. And why is that? Because if a sulfide material, you've got a very smushy sulfide ion, so the magnesium ions can actually move reasonably fast in this so-called Chevrel phase. But if you look very carefully at this rather awful plot of mine, the voltage of this system is only about 1.2 volts. So all the benefits you might in principle have of magnesium are lost because you're back using a sulfide. So again, it's a very, it's, it's an important research area, but it's still far from being commercial. And then just sort of for the sake of completeness, the ones that are really the, the, the ones that you, if you could get them to work would be transformative are sitting in the lithium sulfur and the lithium airspace. So lithium sulfur is a battery where you take you react lithium with sulfur to form Li2S. 
and that gives you an energy density of about 1600 milliampers per gram. So um, depending how you do the numbers, four times more, five, to five times more than the best um, lithium coal oxide based, based system. It's a lower voltage, but you're still gaining on the energy density. Uh, and it, it gives you this high capacity because lithium is light and sulfur is light, and you're changing the oxidation state of sulfur by, by two. The disadvantage of this technology is that sulfur, it's a ring compound, as you start to reduce it to S2 minus, it goes by a whole series of polysulfides. So these are linear uh, sulfur, sulfur um, polyanions, and they're very soluble in the electrolyte. And so what they do is they dissolve in the electrolyte, they shuttle over or migrate over to the anode, and they um, short circuit the battery or just cause these shuttling mechanisms that um, gradually mean that the battery self discharges. And so there's a company, um, Oxys Energy, that was formed in the UK to do this technology that went sadly um, bankrupt during the pandemic, primarily because no one has really solved this problem of how to, to um, solve this problem of crossover. There's a lot of very beautiful work where people make all sorts of nanostructures of carbon so that they can con contain the lithium, the lithium and the, the sulfur inside it, but you're working against the, the thermodynamics of the solution. And then finally, the one that is the sort of holy grail of the battery technology, much as I hate that term, is lithium air. And the reason for that is that this is the only technology that has the same energy density as petrol. And that's because you can react lithium with oxygen to form not the, not the all the way to the Li2O, but you actually form the peroxide. It's, di it's difficult to go all the way, at least at room temperature. But even that gives you an energy density that's 10 times that of a normal conventional lithium ion. The challenge with this is that you form, you take a gas, so you've got to do almost a fuel cell. So you've got to get a, you've got to get the gas into the, the electrolyte, and then you form this solid pro product, lithium peroxide, that's an insulator. And so when you charge, you somehow got to get the electrons into the system to to reoxidize the um, peroxide to form the oxygen, and that is then associated with very large overpotential, meaning you need a very large driving force to get that to work. And the reaction of a peroxide to oxygen goes via a superoxide, and the superoxide is this highly aggressive radical that then attacks the electrolyte. And this is, of course, a bit of a simplification. You can also things like form like things like singular oxygen, which are also highly reactive. And so the challenge at the moment is to try and do this chemistry by introducing things like redox mediators, which are molecules that can go in and oxidize and reduce things in solution. But um, that's, I will find a catalyst that will speed it up. And finally, just two more other applications just to sort of complete this, the where are we going. There's a lot of hype at the moment about solid state batteries. So a solid state battery attacks one of what's seen as one of the major challenges in a battery, and that's the safety. So if you get rid of the liquid, you can prevent short circuiting in principle of the anodes and the cathodes and put a ceramic that conducts a lithium ion. And this is a, some very nice work of a French group, Michel Dolle, where they use smart plasma synthesis to make an all solid state battery. And what you're seeing here is the solid electrolyte, which is a ceramic that where the lithium ions can move through it. This is the anode, this is the cathode, and the, it's to scale, which tells you that the cathode has a much lower energy density, so you need more of it than the anode. It's it's, although it's an SEM, this part is black because you've got carbon in there to allow the electrons to go in. But this thing has to then survive the charging and discharging of materials that expand from four to 10% without cracking. You've also then got to stop the dendrites and other structures that are happening through it. And this is the thing that, or variants of this thing people discuss being in, in car batteries. You can replace the, um, the anode by lithium metal, but you've got to stop the lithiums going through the ceramics and forming dendrites. So it's a real challenge, um, but it's still very much an interesting research area. And finally, if you want to sort of think outside the box, then you do redox flow. And why this is interesting, I mean, it's in some ways it's sort of fairly obvious, is you take a battery and you have a box and in that box is all of the reduce and all of the oxidized materials and how much energy density you get out of it is dictated by the size of your box and how much stuff you have but if you could decouple that 
and actually have separate vats of material. So you could have a, a tank of oxidized liquid and a tank of reduced liquid. And then you, when you want to do charging, you pump it in and then you can scale to as large as you want. And so if you design something like this, in principle, you can make batteries that were big enough for grid storage. Challenge is that the cost is so high. And the reason for the high cost is it's quite difficult to dissolve enough stuff in, in water. And you want to be aqueous because you want to reduce costs as well. And you've got a limited stability window of water. So you've got to get the solubility up. And so the sort of semi-commercial ones are based on vanadium. So you work on the vanadium 4 plus, 5 plus, vanadium 2 plus, 3 plus. But the, the real aim is to try and get organic molecules that you could you know, make much more sustainably. OK, so that's sort of the, the field. I want to talk about now um, sort of some of what we're doing. Obviously, I can't talk about everything, otherwise I'll be I'm late enough already, so I'll get bored. But um, one of the sort of easiest wins to increase sustainability is, is to make your battery last longer. And so if you think about a laptop battery, you know, you're you're lucky if it's it's doing its job three years later, and that maybe gives you an excuse to, to buy another laptop or another iPhone. But if it's a car battery and you've just invested £10,000 in your battery, you, know, you really want to get it to work longer. And the challenge on looking at degradation is a lot of these processes can be very short term, but some of them can be very long term, and which ones are relevant. And so you can have processes that are at the atom layer, so how the atoms are moving around. You can have processes that involve the different particles, and you can have processes that might involve processes at a pack level. And somehow you've also got to study them in a reasonable time frame of a PhD. Um, and so just to sort of reflect a little bit on why batteries fail, one of the sort of worst things about batteries is that there isn't an electrolyte that can survive the difference in redox couple between the anode and the cathode. So your battery is operating at four volts. And so that electrolyte has to be stable both in a highly reduced and a highly oxidized. And you also got current collectors, you've got aluminium and then copper. And you know, you just need have to sort of think more than your first year chemistry to realize you know, something is going on here. And the aim is to stop something going on. And the only way your battery survives is that the electrolyte degrades and it degrades to form something called the SEI, so the solid electrolyte interface. And this is basically just a passivation layer of junk. And there's a junk of battery lithium salts. And so you have lithium fluorides, you have lithium oxides, hydroxides, and carbonates, and you also have various organic compounds. And what that serendipitously discovered passivating layer does is allow the lithium ions to flow through, but it stops the electrolyte solvent molecules from going further through. So you stop the degradation. But the problem is if you use your laptop on your lap, and you go above 60 degrees centigrade, some of these products start to decompose, you get dissolution of some of these things, and that the system continues to react. And so this continual formation of the SCI is one of the major reasons that the lithium cobalt oxide cell gradually uh, dies. Because when you make a battery, you've got lithium cobalt oxide on one side, you've got the electrolyte and you've got carbon, so you've got a fixed amount of lithium in your system. And so if you degrade, then you're taking lithium away from the system, so you're losing the capacity. And then there's sort of other things that I've been talking about. You get this continual particle expansion and cracking, and so you can lose contact between particles um, and, and getting, which results in so-called dead lithium. And then the other thing that's really critical is when you make a material, you typically make it in its um, charge, in its um, thermodynamic state, but when you charge it in the lithium cobalt oxide, you take the lithiums out, it's metastable. And so the, the, the sort of end of charge, the Li.5, is metastable with respect to forming a cobalt spinel, the original lithium cobalt oxide, oxygen, and heat. And it's that heat that then uh, results in the, um, the battery fires. And so what happens typically is you get a short circuit you get very rapid um, heating of your materials. This then releases oxygen, and the oxygen then triggers the fires of the organic electrolyte. And this is why these battery fires are so difficult to put out, because the oxygen isn't coming from the air, the oxygen is coming from within. And so this is why there's a lot of discussion at the moment in terms of how do you do firefighting for electric vehicles, because you can't go around and just spray the cars with water. 
and you know there isn't actually some um, well I've got um, members of my group here who are the sort of safety experts on what to do with lithium fires, but it is not, it's not a trivial thing to put a lithium fire out. So just to sort of think about it again, we need to think about all of the multiple processes over multiple um, times and length scales. And then ideally, we should try and do these things in, in situ. And we might do this because it's efficient way of doing it. And also we might be able to capture products that we might be able to take which you might not be able to see if we took the system apart. And that's sort of the most interesting thing from us is to try and capture um, different metastable products. And so um, I um, lead the UK's activity on battery degradation. So we're experts in Cambridge on degrading batteries. And we use a whole variety of different techniques to understand um, how one specific material degrades. And the material we're working on, which when we started on this uh, three and a half years ago, was very much the, sort of the novel material going to next generation electric vehicles. It's now the standard material in electric vehicles. And it's again, this NMC811, so nickel, manganese, cobalt, 80%, 10%, 10% against graphite. And so that's what's known as a full cell. So we've got the whole of the components together. And we, go, we throw a whole variety of different techniques at it and work with partners in many different universities across the country. Now, what I want to do is just to walk, for those of you who are not battery experts, through just how we go about trying to understand how these batteries operate. So I'm going to start by looking at the NMC811. In fact, I'm going to focus most of this part and talk on that material. And so the first thing you want to do is to work out what its structure is. And so obviously the technique that's the most easier to do the structures on, the most sensible is to use X-ray diffraction. And so we'll take a specially designed battery cell. This is one that works in Argonne National Lab in the US, where you sign synchrotron X-ray diffraction through it. And then you can track the uh, Bragg reflections of your battery material as you charge and discharge it. So you're looking at the X-ray diffraction pattern here, and then this is the voltage on charge and discharge. And all I want to do is to focus on this one reflection here. So this is the 003 reflection. And that's an important one because it tells you the change in the spacings between the layers. So between the nickel manganese cobalt and the next one, the layer below. And so as you can see that as you charge, the layers expand and then they compress again. And so let me just pull that out and show you here. So this is the C parameter so on charging it expands and then it contracts very dramatically. It's quite under, easy to understand why this would happen. So the layers, first of all, are being held together by the lithium ion. So if you've got lithium plus ions here, these layers are now ne negatively charged. And so if you start pulling the lithium ions out, then they start pulling apart because you get repulsions between uh, the oxygens. And then when you get to the close to the top of charge, the met transition metal ions are increasingly more oxidized. They bind more covalently with the oxygen, so they become less negatively charged. And when there are few lithium ions left to prop the layers up, you get this rapid collapse. Now you can pull the, separate, the change in the C parameter up and you can divide it into the expansion of the metal layers and the expansion of the lithium layers. And what you can see is actually um, the lithium ions the lithium layer expands and at about 0.75 is where it starts to collapse. So there's also changes in the metal layer spacing. Then the question then is, particularly in the context of fast charging, is what is the implications for lithium ion ability? So when you charge a battery, you've got to get the lithium ions into the material, they've got to move, you've got to get the electrons in. And so the lithium ions need to move fast in these lithium layers. So what we do is we use a technique of NMR spectroscopy. Apologies for the very simplistic slide for, for many of you, um, but I just want to make a few points. And the point really is that you know, many of you in the organic labs be very familiar with proton and carbon NMR, but of course there's a whole periodic table full of elements with different um, spins and the ones we're interested in are lithium-6 and lithium-7. So lithium-7 is the more abundant one at 90, just over 93%. And we're going to use that uh, where possible. And so, of course, the thing about the NMR is it's element specific and it's also quantitative. OK, so what we're going to do is, first of all, do an ex situ experiment where we make a battery. And when I say we, this is uh, the work of Katharina Merker, 
uh, working with Bill uh, Reeves and Chao Chu, making lots of different batteries. And then she stops on the different states of charge and runs the NMR spectrum of them. So this is the initial material, lithium nickel manganese oxide, and this is the fully charged material. Okay, so this is where the next bit of um, science comes in. This is not the NMR that you've come across in terms of um, just organic diamagnetic materials. These are all paramagnetic materials. So we're going to have to worry about what the unpaired electrons do to the NMR signatures. And so we're going to talk about something called the Fermi contact shift, which is actually identical mathematically to the, and also physically to J coupling. So it's a method a mechanism that involves the transfer of unpaired spin density through the bond from the transition metal ion to the S orbital of the nucleus under investigation. And so because it's a three bond interaction, it tells you something about the nature of um, how the atoms are coordinated. And over the years, this is some very early work of Dong Yu Zheng, she looked at lots of different transition metal ions and worked out relationships between the natures of the oxidation states of the ions or the number of electrons and the shifts. And so if you have a manganese four plus, so there's three electrons in the T2G orbital, you have one unpaired electron per T2G orbital, and you get this very nice 90 degree interaction, which gives you a very positive shift. If you're a nickel, the nickel two plus is D8, you have electrons in the EG orbitals, and then you have, you have EG orbitals that point directly from the nickel to the nickel in a 180 degree interaction, and that gives you a very large positive shift. So the bottom line is, without going into the whole story, is you can rationalize it. And so what Katerina did was to use this to then simulate the NMC811. So what she looked at lithium and worked out all of the probabilities of having nickel four, uh, sorry, nickel two plus, three plus, and manganese four plus, and worked out the distributions. And then she worked out that the, she only got a good fit if the electrons were actually hopping between the nickel two plus and the three plus to give an average oxidation state, and then she could model it. And so what she showed in that simple simulation was that this is an electronic conductor with electrons hopping between nickel two and nickel three. And then if we go to the top of charge where all of the nickel two plus has been oxidized to nickel four plus, nickel four plus is low spin D6, it's diamagnetic, and all you see now are the local configurations for having manganese ions nearby. But the interesting thing is the stuff in between where you get these very sharp peaks. And this is something that those of you um, who have done some NMR will be familiar with. This is a process of chemical exchange. So in our case, it's a process caused by the hopping of the lithium ions. And if you want to propose that something is due to motion, the way you test it is to do variable temperature NMR. So here we're heating something up from 53 degrees to 67 degrees. There's not much of a change. And this is because you've only pulled a little bit of lithium out of the material structure. But when you pull out more lithium, you create more vacancies in the lattice. You can see there's a noticeable change and the lithium ions are starting to move. So then you can simulate this with models for two site exchange and you can then start to extract the hopping frequencies. And so this is now a plot of the hopping frequencies as a state function of state of charge. And so you can see that when you above 25% removal of the lithiums, the lithium ions are hopping from site to site on the lattice with frequencies of higher than 20 kilohertz. So they're moving very fast. There's some assumptions in the model, which is why you've got this quite broad distribution, but you have activation energies of about 0.35 EVs, which is reasonably, makes these materials reasonably fast lithium ion conductors. So this is like the sort of cartoon that I made for some um, financial presentation where this is a, well, Chow made it technically for me, but this is sort of a you know, massive cartoon of the lithium ions going into the structure. Uh, and then you've got more lithium ions coming in, the layers, um, the layers collapse onto them, but you can see that as they expand and contract, the lithium ions are uh, uh, seeing a different environments. So I've talked about the idea of um, the number of vacancies in the lattice. The other thing that I haven't talked about is the role of the transition metals above and below. And so if you analyze transport in these systems, you hop from an octahedral site to a tetrahedral site to an octahedral site. And at that point, there's a saddle point or uh, in that, that hopping process where you're very close to a transition metal in the layer below. And as the charge of that transition metal goes up, 
the activation barrier goes up. So at the top of charge, that's why you get this very um, slower, more sluggish transport. It's not just the collapse of the layers. And so this is then just showing you the mobility uh, as a function of um, charge and discharge. So the bottom line is you can use an A11 cathode between 0.25 and 0.75 and do very fast charging. So having looked at sort of the particle, uh, sorry, the, the atomistic level, I now want to move on to the particle level. And I want to tell you about some new optical experiments. I've been doing collaboration with my colleague, Akshay Rao and the Cavendish, uh, and that's pushed by Alice Merriweather and Chris Nederman and Quentin Jacquet. And so what we're again, we're looking at lithium cobalt oxide. So this was a study of just before the pandemic where um, Akshay said to me, well, what should we look at? And I said, well, let's look at lithium cobalt oxide because we have very big particles and we're inducing it optically we want to be able to see something that's, that's uh, we can actually see uh, easily in, in an optical microscope. And so this is a lithium cobalt oxide particle. You can see that there's a nice sort of flat surface, and that's the top of this lithium cobalt oxide. This is the electrochemistry, so here's the voltage um, as a function of capacity. What we do to look at these things is we plot the derivative of the charge uh, versus the voltage in the so-called DQDD plots. And that allows us to see this sort of flat plateau of a sharp peak, and then another process here of another sharp peak. And so this process here is actually a metal insulator transition, where we go from an insulator here to a metal here, and that's another reason why lithium cobalt oxide works so well. And so what um, Akshay did was to propose using a method um, that's used in a lot of microscopy, sort of just to look at the scattering of light coming into a particle and because scattering is proportional to polarizability, you know, we hypothesize that maybe we would see something in terms of the lithiums moving. And the sort of the push for that was um, this method was developed by Phil Kokura in, in, in Oxford. And again, in his applications used for biology, actually had used it to look at polar bonds in solar materials. Typically, if you want to look at a single particle, what you do is you go to the synchrotron. So I showed you an X-ray machine. Uh, but when, when I was doing X-ray diffraction, I was using a very wide beam, so I was looking at multiple particles. But it is possible to focus your diffraction beam down to nanometers, and then you could um, look at individual particles. But it's quite complicated. You've got to get beam time, and you've got to actually find those particles. And this is something we've done, but it's cumbersome. So we want to do something easier. So we thought we'd give this a go. So here are the ice cap images. So you're going to come down with, um, in the first instance, um, non-polarized light, although now we do it in LED light. And this is the ice cap image, and you can see it's scattering off the, the sharp, it was focused on the flat surfaces of these particles. And what you're measuring is the scattering contrast between the particle and the air or the, the carbon around it. So all this stuff around here is the carbon and the binder that holds the thing in place. So, um, okay, so we can get images. And now the question is, can we actually see something? Now, hopefully this shows in the Zoom call, because this is the sort of cool stuff. So you can see now the first ice cap images of lithium carbon oxide. So this is a solid solution regime where part of lithium is gradually, this is the phase transition, that's phase transition. Solid solution, lithium is coming out, particles are getting darker. Now you can see a phase transition. Watch this phase then. That is the lithium ion front coming through. So if we just watch it again, you can see um, the beginning. So you're into a biphasic region. There's something happening as the lithium are coming in from the edges. Then we're in a solid solution regime where lithium is smoothly coming in, no changes in structure. In a phase transition, watch it. There's another phase transition, watch it. So, okay, what does that mean? Let's now look at these things individually. So this is this, this insulator, the metal phase transition, is sort of the, the one of the major reasons why this material works so well. You, know, you start off with lithium rich, lithium cobalt oxide, that's an insulator. So not really that good because the electrons don't want going in. But what you can then see as you start pulling the lithiums out is that on the delithiation, you get this so-called shrinking core mechanism where the lithium is coming out from the edges and the core is gradually coming in. And on the way back on lithiation, you get a different mechanism. This is called intercalation wave mechanism, where the particle nucleates a new phase, and that phase then gradually moves across the particle. 
So we had this result literally in March 2020. And so we were then in lockdown trying to figure out what was going on. And it turns out what was going on is actually easy to rationalize. And it's due to the very different lipid mobility. So very similar to what I was talking about before between these different phases. So you start off with the original material that's full of lithium, it has low lithium ion transport. You form the next phase, it's metallic, but it's also got very rapid lithium mobility. And so when you start putting lithium out, you pull it out of the edges, that's not surprising. And then you form the blue phase with very good lithium mobility. So it's quite easy for the lithium to come out of this phase. And so the core gradually shrinks. But in the other direction, you nucleate this pink phase. The pink phase has poor lithium ion mobility. The lithium ions can't go through it. So the only way to sort of increase that is for the lithium to move through the blue phase and add on to the pink phase, and so it grows in that direction. And so it's the differences between the lithium mobility in these two phases that drive these different mechanisms. And we did some um, continuum model simulations to support that. Okay, so what are the implications of that? So the implications are um, that these particles um, are actually sustaining extremely high rates when they're doing this. And you can watch a particle and you can quantify how fast the pumps are moving through it. And so this is our original particle. It's actually sitting there thinking about doing a phase transition. It starts and then sort of gives up, it just sort of nucleates something. And it isn't until the end of the, the point where it should do something that it finally starts to delithiate. And when the, when the core collapses, it's collapsing at a rate that's very fast. So I'm using a term for the rate that we use in batteries of 2C. So a 1C rate means that you charge your battery an hour. A 2C rate means you charge it in 30 minutes. And so at some points, this thing is charging at a rate of 10C at the particle level. So that's a six minute charge. So these lithium ion battery materials can actually be charged extremely rapidly if you get the lithiums to them fast enough. And there are times, for example, here in this one where I'm using a, um, a 6C rate and it's hitting a, a maximum rate of 25C, so almost a two minute, three minute charge. So I wanna just tell you one more um, uh, phase transition story because it's an interesting one. And this is associated with the monoclinic phase transition. So if you go almost to the top of charging of LCO, you put Li.5 covered oxide. And at this point, you can actually form an ordered compound where the lithium ions, the vacancies, and the lithium ions order in this structure. Now, your initial material, where you didn't have any ordering, had a threefold symmetry axis running through it. So it was a rhombohedral structure. But now you can see you no longer have that threefold symmetry axis and it forms a distorted structure, a monoclinic structure. And so what you're seeing then is this monoclinic distortion and ordering of the compound as you go through that phase transformation. Now it's difficult to see, so I'll just stop it for you. And so this is um, an example of a particle that's actually forming an ordered compound where the ordering is across the whole particle. But then in cycle four, it actually nucleates and grows in a particle with three different domains that are ordered with respect to each other when they hit. Because if you start to nucleate in three different parts of the particle, when the three domains hit, there's no way they can resolve it. And so they form this domain structure. So this is um, what you're seeing here, the formation of this domain structure in it. Anyway, so that's a sort of cool um, story of how you watch these things. I can carry on for another five, 10 minutes, or just let me know. Um, yeah, I'm just... Um, so I just want to talk a little bit now about the in situ NMR, which is um, something that we've just, you know, we've essentially developed in our group for now more than 10 years. And this is uh, uh, where we, you know, I showed you the ex situ NMR, but in the ex situ NMR, you had to charge a battery to different states, you pulled it apart and did the NMR. So it'd be much more straightforward if we could just do in situ NMR. But of course, it's very difficult. You can't just take a battery uh, ironically, the, um, <clears throat> the battery of this laser pointer is uh, dying. Um, let's try this one. This one, let's try this battery pen. Uh, you, because you can't take the normal uh, you know, battery and shove it in an NMR coil, um, primarily because it's got a metal can. And so you can't get RF, RF through a metal can. So we've done a lot of work over the years to develop um, battery um, that will work. 
There's also challenges about the system. We have to deal with have to deal with metals. We need to deal with um, paramagnetic materials. We have shifts that go all over the place, and so you need to be able to excite all of these different frequencies. And then in an NMR system, NMR is basically a radio frequency um, coil, and so you get a lot of pickup. And so one of the biggest pickups in the room is is the the frequency of light. So you've always um, got 50 hertz from the AC coming in. Uh, you've got the radio frequency channels. So, you know, uh, radio four or whatever, radio one or whatever you watch is listen to is, is all 90, 94 megahertz. So if you're in those sort of frequencies, there's a problem. And so we've got to filter them out. So this is a, an example of a, the tuning of an NMR circuit with, with filtering, and this is without filtering. And that's all pick up from, from the room coming in because your battery is acting as an antenna to pick up um, radio frequency signals. So initially we developed these little plastic bag batteries. So these are, are often called coffee cell batteries because you use the same plastic that you seal coffee in or you feel smoked salmon in, except here we're going to use a mesh. Uh, and then you put um, a separator to separate the anode and cathode. So there's that one anode and there's a cathode and you use a laminator just to stick it all together and you shove it in a battery. Uh, but the problem with the plastics is they let air through gradually and moisture. So we also have these capsule cells, which are just plastic batteries basically, which are easier to work with. And then we also designed, um, uh, this, and this is work of um, initially Barish Key and then Oli Pesha, uh, probes together with an NMR company where we could actually tune the, um, the, tune the, the NMR probes on the fly uh, with robots. So I just want to show you one application, um, and this is uh, work of Alex Force and how, uh, when he was in my lab a few years ago, how Wang and John Griffin, where we used it to um, look at supercapacitors. And so supercapacitors are, again, one of the fastest charging systems, um, but um, what, what you do in them, so this is a Rigoni plot where you're plotting uh, energy density versus power. So this is a traditional dielectric capacitor and the capacitor, super capacitor is up there and there you work with porous carbons. You put the ions in the pores and when you charge um, charge up, you form, you put the ions into pores and you can do that um, either by inserting ions or ejecting them and we can track them by NMR spectroscopy. So here we're watching the BF4 ions going in and out of the lattice and you can work out the mechanisms. And I don't want to spend too long on that. I'm actually gonna go faster. So I just wanna quickly tell you the Nyavolt story. So this is, um, you know, just, so I'm now turning into, this is a bit of a mixture of um, PR and science. So you have to humor me, but you know, imagine a world, and I, I have to say this with a straight face, where you don't worry about charging times. And so, you know, if you could charge your battery infinitely fast, you could have a smaller one. So you wouldn't have to worry about where you found the charging point because you knew that it would be empty because the last person had gone and you could have a smaller and more sustainable battery. You would also be able to have much more rapid response in the great grid. So the question is, why can't you charge faster? And so I already talked about the cathodes and I've introduced them as being, as long as you work in the right uh, lithium range, you can charge them fast enough. But the real reason you can't charge faster is heat. And this is a, um, a heat map of a, a conventional lithium ion. So this is a Samsung battery charged um, rapidly. And you can see within a, in one minute, it's hit 60 degrees. And the critical thing of 60 degrees is that's where the SEI starts to degrade. And so everything goes wrong. The passivation goes wrong, the cathode starts to degrade. And so that's what limits it. There's another reason why you can't charge faster, and that's associated with dendrite formation. So um, on the anode, uh, you have um, the lithium ions go into to the lithium graphites, but if you charge too fast, they, instead of intercalating nicely, uh, form these lithium dendritic structures on the surface. And so this is what the dendrites look like. This is a picture of a dendrite from a former student, Anna Gunnar's daughter. The dendrites look beautiful. But they're actually not good news in your batteries because they can short circuit. And these short circuits are what 
um, at least was thought to take the Dreamliner um, batteries and the Dreamliner planes down a few years ago. Uh, they also do things like form lithium on top of them, and that consumes lithium from your cell. So we do a lot of work in this lab in understanding uh, how dendrites form. And because of time, I won't go into it in great detail, but this is an in situ plot of um, dendrites growing in real time. So you're watching the lithium ions going backwards and forwards in a lit lithium symmetric cell. Here's the lithium dendrite forming. This is the SEI, the passivating layer that's forming on top. And so you can actually see in, in sped up real time the growth of this passivation layer. Um, we can also use magnetic resonance imaging. So this is again, some early work showing the formation of these um, lithium dendrites. Ah, come on, pointer. So this is the dendrite forming across and it actually forms when you get uh, a depletion of your electrolyte and you form an electric field that drags the lithium across to the other side. And so we understand how and when dendrites form. It's quite another different matter though to stop the process. So this is some nice work of, um, again, of Katerina who looked at the, uh, the full cell, the NMC811, and she was able to, in various clever NMR experiments, separate the signal. So this is now in situ from the NMC and the graphite. So this is the NMC cycling backwards and forwards. This is the graphite peaks. Um, but when she took the cell down to low temperature, you can see that this peak here, this line, you have to trust me, is actually uh, the signal of lit lithium metal. So it's at 249 ppm. And so one of the problems in an electric vehicle is, is a cold, um, is cold operation. When you're down at low temperatures, everything moves more slowly. So it's harder to get that lithium into the graphite and so you start plating. So then you think about how do I design for fast charging? So you need to find a, a material that operates above zero volts to stop the plating. So there's a lot of niobates and titan titanates that do that. And then you need some high mobility. So some of the materials with the highest mobility are found in principle in these uh, perovskite or rhenium trioxide structures. So these are octahedra coordinated. If you put a lithium into these structures, the problem is the sizes or the holes are just the wrong size. So the lithiums actually start, the units start to rotate and they lock the lithiums in place. So in principle, that structure should be very rapid for lithium transport, but because of the changes in the element sizes, the metal sizes as you reduce them, it doesn't work very well. And so what um, Kent Griffiths, a former student in my lab, looked at was a whole series of materials that can accommodate all this structural changes by first of all, uh, forming these shears. So if you think about uh, the material I just talked about, if you take away oxygens along this shear plane, the structure um, accommodates that by forming a shear. And that's what's formed in TiO2, so a rutile compound, when you reduce it um, at high temperatures. Now, if you do this in um, two directions, in niobium oxides, you can form, uh, again, these um, edge-sharing uh, niobium octahedra. If you do it in two directions, you form blocks. And then when you put lithiums in there, the structure's rigidly held so it doesn't distort. And so Kent um, looked at a whole variety of different niobium oxides and found that this NB16 tungsten 5O55 was the best in class. And then um, was able to then um, to look at it and show they had very rapid um, uh, lithium ion mobility. And this is a paper in the Journal of Electrochemical Society where Ken, Yumi, Quentin, and, and Didi were able to look at and optimize this in a full cell, so against lithium ion phosphate and an NMC material, and show you could get some very high rates with very little optimization of the structure. So they're getting a, a 20C rate, so a 20C is a three minute charge and only a small decrease in the, the discharge capacity. So, and this is just showing you that with a minimal optimization using standard um, lithium electrolytes, they were able to go out to 500 cycles. So why does it work? So you want to then use techniques to understand it. The, the major technique for looking at lithium mobility and quantifying it, if you can, is pulse field gradient spectroscopy. So this is a method where you do a, an echo, you put a gradient on it, and if during the pulse sequence, the lithium ions move, you lose the signal. And so when you measure this, you can extract a lithium diffusion coefficient of about 10 to the minus 11 
it's 10 to the minus 13 meters squared, uh, meters squared centimeters to the minus one. So why, why is that number important? So if you then analyze uh, how fast do you need to do for fast charging, if you're a liquid electrolyte, your diffusion coefficient is about 10 to the minus 10, which means in a three minute charge, you can move 330, mi 330 microns. If you're graphite, you can only move a micron. So it means if you want to get graphite uh, fast charging, you've got to sort of work with micron sized particles. But our materials can actually move 33 microns in, in three minutes. So we can actually work with these very high surface area particles, which minimize the degradation. So we do other things. This is work of um, John Koser and Andrew Morris in collaboration with the group to try and understand the electronic conductivity. Uh, and the main thing is that you have electrons that go in and they form an orbital or a band that goes along these tunnels. So not only do the lithium ions move fast, the electrons do too. And then just finally, just uh, looking at this, this is what I normally say to the investors. If you don't understand any of this, you can at least look at the pictures and this is the these are the materials being lithiated for optical method. And so with that, I think I should just end by just showing you a little movie. Uh, this is now our uh, material sort of being charged in uh, 100 seconds. And you can see it's, it still heats up, it's not magic. And then it can be used and off it goes and it charges a vacuum cleaner of a company that shall remain nameless, but is fairly obvious how the vacuum cleaners can be used. So there are other things that I won't talk about, but I think um, I just wanted to end by, um, sorry for those, you, you have to somehow figure out how to get to the end of the talk. We can use this ice cap measurement to look at uh, particle cracking and other things. We've done some work, uh, which I won't talk about on redox flow batteries and using our in-situ NMR method to develop that. It's a really interesting solution in NMR chemistry for those of you who are interested in solution uh, state things, you can use our methods to follow it. But I will end by going to the end, which is the way one should. And so I hope I've been able to show you that you know, we can use a whole rich variety of different characterization methods. I've talked about the ice cat, a lot about the NMR and the MRI to try and understand how these batteries work. And in the fast charging story, at least I was able to show you how you could think about how the ions move in a material and then ultimately move it through to a commercial company, which hopefully will have some impact and I think one of the things that's really interesting is, or exciting is that the battery market is growing so fast that there's room for different types of chemistries, lots of different markets, but you know, we have to do this in a sustainable way because there's no point otherwise trying to make even more problems for the 2050 agenda. And with that, this is my wonderful research group. I try to mention as many people as I could on the way. Um, this is unfortunately a picture of two years ago um, which I need to replace, but um, I think I've essentially mentioned everybody. I should mention Marco, who's the in situ person who's been helping us. People at um, the Diamond Light, Size Sor Light Source have also been helping with the diffraction. And thank you very much for listening, and apologies for the late start. <laughs> <laughs>